Many of London's open spaces were bequeathed to us by the Victorians. Private gardens were made public for those who were gardenless. Open spaces created for children who had only streets to play in. This park was once a patchwork of clay and grass tennis courts. Now much of it has turned into scrub as interest in outdoor activity has waned as the Victorian ideal has faded. Scrubland is a very productive habitat. Plants are still very young and every year there is a surge of new growth. The young shoots and the insects that feed from them provide food for large populations of animals. As there is still not a large variety of plants, scrub will attract only general feeders like the tit family. Fussy eaters like the nuthatch will not do well here. But the volume of new growth will attract those general feeders in great numbers. The shyest member of the tit family is the long-tailed tit. Most of the year they keep to family flocks, separating only to build their nests gathering together again as soon as the young are fledged. This pair are building their nest deep in the bramble. When the eggs hatch, the nest will be hidden under the bramble's leaves and it will be protected from predators by the bramble's sharp thorns. Their elaborate nest, woven from twigs, moss and feathers, is one of the most complex and durable in the bird kingdom. As it takes four weeks to build, the long-tailed tits must be sure that they are building it in the right place. The magpie's nest by comparison is an untidy and clumsy affair. Heavy twigs are dragged into the crown of an oak tree, where they are arranged into what looks like kindling for a bonfire. But once the oak is in leaf, the nest will be hidden and will serve its purpose. The process which transforms a barren clay tennis court into scrub is called succession. As the court falls into disuse, plants begin to invade, first around the edges of the court, as rhizomes creep under the fence. Then, as windblown seeds take root, green appears on other parts of the court. In a short time, the tennis court becomes overrun with plants. At first, only the shallow roots of annual plants can penetrate the tiny cracks in the hard clay. But as they die and decay, the humus fertilizes the topsoil as it begins to break up. Larger, more woody plants now find space to set their roots and sufficient nutrients to grow. Willows are among the first trees to colonize new ground. As the pollen carries over great distances, the male plant can grow miles away from the female plant, but still manage to fertilize it. If the wind should fail to carry the pollen, bees emerging from winter hibernation and hungry for a meal of nectar will bring the pollen on their bodies and wings.
Each stage of succession gives way very reluctantly to the next. It may take 15 years before shrubs and young trees start to appear on the abandoned tennis courts. Blackthorn, willow, alder and birch are the trees most suited to this second stage of succession. They share an efficient method of seed dispersal, an ability to root easily and to grow quickly. By early April, the robins have already seen their first brood fledged. If the eggs are laid too early or the weather turns cold or wet, then the harvest of insects and grubs the chicks depend on for food will not materialize. This spring has been cold. Of the normal clutch of five eggs laid in the robin's nest, only one chick has survived. Most birds use trees to nest and hide. A common tree on open spaces is the sycamore. Its leaves are just beginning to unfurl. Fresh buds and aphids attract common native birds like the blue tit and wren. as well as migrants like the black cap. Compared to mature woodland, this is a simple ecosystem. All energy is eaten up in growth. It is only when space runs out that growth slows down. Then, unused energy will be returned to the soil. As nutrients build up in the soil, Conditions change to the advantage of slower growing trees like the oak and beech. It will take over a century before this transformation is complete, but some indicators of that final successional stage are already here. The speckled wood butterfly cannot survive outside woods. It basks in the dappled sunlight under the canopy where temperature and moisture are just right. arrive from Africa in early spring. There the tropical rains have destroyed their main source of food, the insects. Or here the warm weather has brought insects onto the wing. A roaming flock of red poles have interrupted their passage to feast on the catkins of this young oak tree. Where the trees are still young, food is plentiful. It's a free-for-all, and the animals best equipped to take advantage reap the rewards. Nesting birds synchronize their egg hatching with this early spring abundance of buds and grubs. Blackbird chicks spend only a few days in the nest before they fledge. They are then at their most vulnerable, a harvest for the hungry chicks of the kestrels and owls. The blue tits also have young, and like the blackbirds, scour the undergrowth for grubs and caterpillars to bring back to the nest. Grubs now are harder to find, which does not constrain the appetite of the blue tit single fledgling. The 
the finches are most vulnerable at this time of year. Their diet of seeds, prolific in the autumn but exhausted by early spring, is not yet supplemented by other sources of food. The ripening seeds on the pollinated willow are a welcome meal. Where shrubland gives way to woodland, woodland birds compete for food. The wren's family waits for food under the eaves of the groundsman's shed where they were born. As growth slows down and conditions become more stable, a greater diversity of plants find a place to grow. Conditions favour the specialist plants, at the expense of the opportunist plants typical of the early stages of succession. They grow in shady spots, where the processes of decomposition have already enriched the soil. The fragrance of the blossom of first hawthorn and then elder fill the longer summer evenings. As long as the courts are used, trampling will destroy any tentative growth. But the grasses, wildflowers and bushes that surround the courts hold the seed banks that will eventually reclaim them. The plants adopt different strategies to cross the protective fences. Some, growing in colonies, extend their rhizomes slowly onto new ground. Others give their seeds downy parachutes to be carried on the wind. Others wrap their seeds in a fruit, which once eaten are dropped by passing animals. The vetch propagates vegetatively, nurturing young plants through suckers attached to the parent. There is no genetic variety in this strategy. Each new plant is an exact replica of its parent. Pollination adds variety, giving each new plant a different genetic makeup. Bees visit several plants to feed, mixing and distributing the pollen as they go. The new plant will have the resilience born of its mixed genes. Natural soil conditions return once the courts are abandoned. Groundwater seeps back to the surface, encouraging the growth of specialist wetland plants. There are only 49 species of orchid growing in Britain, so to find one growing naturally in the city is quite unexpected. More than any plant, orchids are vulnerable to changes in habitat. As marshes are drained in the countryside, they are becoming rare. Of all the plants associated with butterflies, the buddleia is the best known. It's a plant that grows well in poor conditions, taking root practically anywhere. Its flowers store a rich nectar, and its sweet scent will draw butterflies from all around. Britain does not have the best climate for butterflies. Of the 15,000 known species worldwide, only 55 manage to survive in Britain. Their lives are complex. Each butterfly passes through three stages, an egg, a caterpillar and a chrysalis before finally emerging as a butterfly. The time spent in each stage differs with each species. For the tortoise shell, life as a butterfly is short. Three generations of tortoise shells succeed each other through the summer, each dying soon after laying its eggs. The fourth generation hibernates over winter to mate in the spring. British butterflies generally seem dour when compared to the colours and patterns of Mediterranean butterflies, but not the peacock. With its wings folded it seems unremarkable. 
but if disturbed it opens up its wings. The startling contrast of its black body to the bright color surrounding the fierce eye pattern on its upper wings is enough to see off most predators. A kestrel sits on a favourite perch. This is good hunting territory. The blackbird chick is especially vulnerable. Still flightless, it cannot escape if the kestrel spots it. The death of a butterfly to feed a blackbird chick is no less of a loss than the death of the chick to feed the kestrel. The food chain, the passage through which energy is passed from plants to insects to animals to higher predators, reflects the health of a community. As losses occur up the food chain, as butterflies are lost to small birds and small birds to larger birds, there are always butterfly eggs safely deposited in the ground and chicks who will successfully fledge. Losses to predation are necessary as a healthy ecosystem imposes checks and balances on its own expansion. By July the fields are filled with the song of the grasshopper. The adult grasshopper lives only a short time and must mate and lay its eggs before the grasses wither. The males sing to attract passing females. If he is successful and fertilizes her eggs, his role is complete and he dies soon afterwards. By September the fields will have fallen silent again. Mint flowers late in the summer and is a welcome source of nectar for the insects as other plants are fading. The hedge brown has a short life as a butterfly, spending most of its life cycle as a caterpillar. It hatches from an egg in September, overwinters as a caterpillar and does not emerge as a butterfly until late July. In its short life its prerogative is to mate so that the next generation might be secure. It takes over two hours for the male to fertilize over 150 eggs. The eggs are laid on the bramble, the favorite food plant of the hedge brown caterpillar. The further advanced the stages of succession, the nearer to the final stage of stable woodland a community has gone, the more animals will be able to live and feed in it. Succession follows a predictable course. Within two years, the abandoned tennis court is covered with annual weeds. Over the next 12 years, perennial shrubs take their place, giving way to trees after 35 years. Fast-growing plants like the willow herb, producing huge numbers of seeds, characterize the early stages. Slower growing shrubs like the hawthorn, producing less seeds, characterize the later stages. They depend on birds and other animals for their distribution, who will dispose of the hard seed after eating the fleshy berry. Slower growth, fewer seeds and slower, less certain methods of distribution slow down the rate of succession.
Gossamer threads on the grass and the profusion of spiders are sure signs that summer is over. The seeds within the ash keys are ready to fall. The tits, as always, are eager to exploit these resources. As succession advances, conditions change in ways that will not favour these early colonisers. As the variety of plants increase, new animals find a niche they are able to exploit. As the rate of growth slows down and availability of resources decrease, competition increases. Then animals that can live in a crowded world of limited resources will fare better. Larger animals who can store food in their body fats, eliminating the need to scavenge constantly, will dominate. General feeders like the tits will fare less well. They do not have the specialist skills that will guarantee a place in a more crowded environment. The mature habitat of the old courts, abandoned many years ago, are already well on their way to mixed woodland. It's from here that the seeds and nutrients are exported to the younger habitats, the recently abandoned courts, still expanding in the early stages of succession. This unusually varied mixture of habitats coexist in a very small area. Woodland birds like the kestrel and woodpecker live alongside grassland species like the meadow brown butterfly and the grasshopper. Maturing oaks grow near ragwort and daisies. As the younger habitats quickly expand, catching up with the older habitats as they slow down, all traces of the old courts will disappear under the canopy of mature, deciduous woodland. But, as so often happens in the city, people intervene. Wasteland is land wasted. Beneath the bulldozers go the willow, alder and birch, food and protection for the tits and finches. Into the fire go the grasses and wildflowers, and with them the eggs of next year's butterflies, and the seeds of the orchids that had found such an unlikely home here. But other sites will appear. Some of the colonising plants may be the seeds of plants that once grew here. The tenure of plants and animals on the city's wild spaces is often temporary, but the evicted plants and animals will hope to find another place to stay.